Good morning and welcome. It's a great day because our God is on his throne, sovereign, glorious, and trustworthy. Today we will do as we do every week. We will honor and glorify him. Well, it's Missions Month, and we're blessed this morning to hear Dr. Kurt Urbanik. Pastor Scott will introduce him. And along with all our ongoing ministries, we do have two special events coming up for families with children and families with teens. So be sure to check out our website and join us. Let's begin our time declaring God's word in Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the noon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we have set aside this time to worship you. We will offer our praises and give thanks for your many blessings. We will confess our sins, lift our burdens, and pray for the needs of others. We will honor your word as your servant speaks. Minister through him to us and give us the faith to hear, to trust you, and to obey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sin 
Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our emphasis this week is on international missions. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So. As we kick off our Operation Christmas Child shoebox drive, which is such an important avenue that we have to share the gospel with children around the world and their families, let's pause for a few moments and spend some time with the Lord in prayer. Would you bow with me? God is great and greatly to be praised. Take time now and glorify Him. It is important to lift one another up in prayer. Take a moment now and pray for someone in Jesus' name. Lastly, ask the Father to speak to your heart as you prepare to hear His Word. Heavenly Father, there is none like you. We praise your name and give you glory. You are the one true God. Thank you for your word and for how it encourages us in our daily walk with you. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And this goes well beyond our abilities and our situations. You're reminding us to be content and to trust in you and you alone. So Lord, may we completely trust in you as we look to the future. We also pray now for the gifts that we will be packaging in shoeboxes over the next several weeks, that they be put together with love. And as they are sent out and the gospel goes forth around the world, may we be reminded of what you said in Isaiah. My word shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe. 
Holy Spirit, I got you. 
As part of our mission's emphasis, we are having a couple of missionaries share with us about what God is doing in other parts of the world with the gospel. Today's sermon is from Kurt Urbanek, an International Mission Board missionary to Cuba for over 20 years. Kurt has served alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ in Cuba, and he has witnessed one of the largest church planning movements in the world. From 1960 until 1990, Cuban Baptists planted 28 churches. In 1990, the Lord started moving among the people of Cuba. In 1990, there were a total of 238 Baptist churches in the whole country. By the end of 2019, here is what God has done in Cuba so far. They've planted 1,250 churches, 1,200 missions, 6,845 house churches. There are 524 pastors and over 2,400 missionaries. In 2019 alone, Cuba saw 78,000 professions of faith. Cuban Baptists are sending missionaries to unreached people groups to share the love of Christ and the gospel with the nations, even as Cubans suffer under difficult circumstances. I've had the honor of being friends with Kurt and Wendy Urbanic for many years and serving alongside them in a previous church. Unfortunately, quarantine rules prevented Kurt from delivering this message to us in person. But we felt it was so important to hear about what God is doing in Cuba that we have asked Kurt if we could use a previous message he preached at First Baptist Weston a couple of years ago. Our prayer is that Kurt's message on engaging in the mission of God will move you to participate in missions by praying, giving, sending, or going on mission. The first thing I want to do is I want to thank you, First Baptist Church at Weston. Uh, every member of this church for uh, your support these last 20 years. I want to thank you for the response that, that this church has had for the, the, the hurricanes that we've experienced in Cuba last year with Matthew and uh, this year with Irma, and just the amazing way we've been able to share uh, food and shelter and water, clean water to people all across Cuba. I want to thank you also for sending generous offering to the Florida Baptist Convention for, uh, for their, their work of disaster relief as they work not only in Cuba but in other countries. Over the last 20 years, this church has been involved in, in missions in, in Mexico, in Dominican Republic, in Ireland, in Jamaica, in England, in Colombia, in Germany, in Africa, in Canada, in Venezuela, and Cuba. And I am sure that there are other places that you have gone and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that every place you go, if you travel overseas or if you travel to your local store, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God dwells within you. The gospel of Christ has been given to you for you to be able to share with those who need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord of life. This morning we're going to be talking about engaging with God in his mission. Engaging in the mission of God. Our text is Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 through 38. If you'll stand with me, open your copy of God's word. In reverence for God's word, let's read this passage. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Then he saw, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you be seated? From parallel passages, we gather that Jesus took a small band of disciples and then went throughout Galilee preaching and teaching and healing. From town to town, in synagogues by the shores of the lake, in open fields and marketplaces, house to house, it says in all the cities and villages of the, region, of the region, Jesus declared that the kingdom of God was in their midst. Matthew gives us a three, threefold description of Jesus' ministry 
that his ministry was one of teaching, of proclaiming the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing. In our text, we're going to talk about three central points this morning. The Savior's proclamation, the Savior's compassion, and the Savior's command. We see the Savior's proclamation in chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Jesus went forth proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, telling the people that the king had come. They had been living under the bondage of the law for so long. And now he was telling them that the kingdom of God is in your midst. The Apostle Paul would later talk about the gospel in these terms. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16 he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, for the Jews first and also for the Greeks. God has given us this gospel to share with every man, woman, boy, and girl. Every person needs an opportunity to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know what is this gospel? What is the good news? Well, the good news is the fact that God, the God of the universe, so loved the world, so loved each one of you, so loved each person on this planet that he sent his only son to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to die on a cruel, rugged cross, to be buried in a borrowed tomb, to be raised from the dead, to ascend to the right hand of the Father, to send out the Holy Spirit of God to indwell believers, to empower his church, and right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is interceding for you and for me. The Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. And the one last thing, the Lord Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen? He's coming back for his bride, for a spotless bride. He's coming back to judge the world. And he has given us a message of hope that can help the world escape the coming judgment. We see what the gospel is. We've been given a command to go and to share. And now let's look at the Christ, the compassion of the Savior. In verse 36, he said, when, the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. As Jesus traveled, he taught and he preached. He saw the multitudes. He saw where they lived. He saw how they lived. And he was moved deeply. Because he saw them as sheep, distressed and defenseless. Without a shepherd to take care of them. Without anyone to protect them. This was a harsh commentary on the lack of leadership of the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day. The expression sheep without a shepherd reflects the Old Testament language and depicts Israel as a flock in need of new leadership. The phrase harassed and helpless describes a flock that is lying down on the ground exhausted. Harassed and helpless literally means torn down, mangled, and thrown to the ground. Predators and possibly even unscrupulous shepherds had ravaged the sheep. Look around today at the people around you. Are they not in the same condition? People are begging and crying out for leadership. They're looking for justice and righteousness in this world. And they are like sheep without a shepherd looking for someone to give them a message of hope. And God has entrusted that message to you and to me to be able to share with them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our greatest missionary example. 
He left the throne room of heaven. He humbled himself. He took on human flesh. He sat where we sat. Talks about he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. In John chapter 1 verse 14, the Bible says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Hebrews chapter 14 verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. He understands where we are. He understands the things that we go through. He has compassion upon us and gives us an opportunity to come to him in faith and to come to know him as Lord and Savior of life. We've seen the Savior's proclamation, the Savior's compassion, and finally, we can see the Savior's command. In verses 37 and 38. Now what was the situation that Christ was talking about? In verse 37, he said that to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is all around us, and God is calling you and I to be, get in on what he's up to. For you see, God is at work. God is moving. God is speaking to people. God is convicting people. And he is waiting for, for like they say, that, that a Christian is, is, is an embodiment of the message of Jesus Christ. That we are to go and to share the love of our, our Lord and our Savior with them. People are harassed and helpless and they need the good word, the good news of Jesus Christ. And what was the solution that Jesus provided to his disciples in verse 38? Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. The, the, the meaning of the phrase to send forth means literally to cast forth or to, to, to push forth. Now why would, why would he use that phrase? And the reason is, is because we become so comfortable with our lives that sometimes we need a holy push. We need a, a, something that, that moves us and motivates us to get outside of ourselves and to realize that the people around you, you may not know this, but the people around you, many of them want to know salvation sometimes more than we want to share it. I look at, at, at times at, at people's conditions. And a lot of times the, the, the people that you would least likely think would come to Christ are the ones that are the most ready. Sometimes their behavior is nothing more than a cry that says, does anyone care? Does anyone love me enough to say enough is enough? God loves you. God cares for you. He wants you to know what it is to come to know him. Jesus was training his disciples to look outside themselves, to see the world as he sees it. To understand that this small group of disciples were never going to be able to complete the task themselves. So instead of saying, run out into the harvest, he said, pray. And believe it or not, prayer is an amazing strategy. We can accomplish things in other places around the world through prayer. Let's say you can't go to China today, but you can pray. Let's say you can't get on a plane and go to India, but you can pray. The Lord gives us an opportunity to go into our closet of prayer, to talk to our Heavenly Father, to raise before Him the lost masses of this world, and pray that God would touch their lives, and then we can become even answers to our own prayers. How many of you have friends or family or even enemies that you wish would come to know the Lord Jesus? How many of you? We all do. But when I go out and share my faith with someone, or you go out and share your faith with someone, do you realize that you're, you are being the answer to someone else's prayer? So if you want people to come to know the Lord, we have got to get out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you had the, the cure of cancer, boy, you would be running out into the streets and the byways telling people how they could be, be delivered from that horrible disease. 
We have something even greater than that. We have a cure for eternal cancer, eternal death, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to understand that the work is, is greater than just we ourselves. It's greater than, than our church. It's greater than our denomination. It is a kingdom job. And the Lord has supplied everything we need in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the message of the Word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You realize the International Mission Board is the largest Protestant mission sending organization in our country has over 3,800 missionaries. We've got over 5,000 home mission board missionaries. And guess what? It is not even close to enough. There are over 3,800 unreached people groups. That means groups with less than 2% evangelical. If we sent every missionary we had to one of those groups by themselves, we would still not have enough. So we need to pray for the Lord of the harvest to to push out laborers into his harvest. It's always always important to remember the last words that someone says. The last words that Jesus said before he ascended to the Father we find in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Acts 1.8, he said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God has commanded us to go forth and make disciples. And he's given us the very power of the living God, the power of the Spirit of God to be able to accomplish the task. Our job is not to convict people. Our job is not to save people. Our job is to share the good news. It's, 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 it's amazing that we have an opportunity to share life, to share eternal life, with every man, woman, boy, and girl. God has given us such a precious, precious gift. Now, Wendy and I have had the blessing of serving with the International Mission Board for over 26 years. We started off in the Dominican Republic, and and while there, we were able to work with national partners to to plant five different churches, four with Dominicans and, and one with Haitian refugees. We worked with people in, in, in towns and villages. We worked uh, with people that were uh, just in, in amazing conditions of need. The per capita income at the time was $680 a year. So you can imagine what, what the things were like. So 1997 uh, until present, we've been working in Cuba. Cuba is an amazing harvest field. Let me give you an example. In 1960, following the, the triumph of the revolution, Cuban Baptists began to work under increasingly difficult conditions. From 1960 to 1990, Cuban Baptists planted 28 churches in 30 years. And believe it or not, that was an amazing accomplishment under those conditions. During that time, they prayed to the Lord of the harvest. Father God, Please pour out your spirit on this place. Let us see your glory fill this nation. Their prayer since 1905, the founding of the conventions, was Cuba for Christ. And I was there in 1997 when they changed that theme to Cuba for Christ now. Cuba para Cristo ya. In 1990, the Lord broke out in Cuba. We started with 238 churches. Today, we have 1,137 churches, 1,424 missions, and 6,925 house churches, all for the glory of God. 9,000 plus churches, just among Baptists. 
Guess how many pastors? With 508 ordained pastors. Doesn't take much to do the math. Now, wait a minute. 1,137 churches, 508 pastors. 1,424 missions, 508 pastors. 6,925 house churches, 508 pastors. What it means is the laity in Cuba has been released into the harvest fields. They open their homes as prayer centers, as casa de oración, houses of prayer. They reach out to their neighbors. Did you know prayer evangelism is amazing? It's not confrontational. It's just saying, listen, is there something I can pray for you about? Is there something, if if God existed, and there was something that, that you wanted from God, what would it be? Can I pray for you? So people say, well, I have this need or that need or my child's sick or this is happening. And the people begin to pray. God begins to answer prayer. And people begin to come to them saying, wow, look what's happened. God has done all of these things. Our own church has been sending teams for a number of years and doing different projects. Last year, our church sent a team to Havana. Uh, We got together with about 100 missionaries from different parts of Cuba. And we came together and went out and did evangelism in in these high-rise buildings in central Havana and old Havana. I can't even describe to you what those buildings are like inside. Usually when there's really hard rainstorms, uh, some of them collapse. So you can imagine what they look like inside. And during that week, we saw 664 people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel out in the streets of Havana. We saw people invited to come in church, and we saw amazing things. Uh, People who had never gone on international mission trips, for example, like um, Kim and Joe Burns, went into a high-rise building. They knocked on a door. A man opened the door and walked out in his underwear. Now, how do you like that? Go out and visiting, this guy walks out in his underwear. Well, they didn't know this, but he'd been sleeping uh, because he worked all night. And he walked out and they, you know, of course, well, you know, well, we're here to tell you good news. And, and, And they shared with him the gospel and they invited him to the service that night. Well, he came to the service that night and when the invitation was given, he passed up front, walked up on the stage and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of life. Well, we sat down with him afterwards to hear his story. He said, well, for several months, he said, I've lost several of my friends to either suicide or overdoses or accidents. He said, and and I've been involved in Santeria, which is West African traditional religion dressed up as a Catholic. And I've been involved in this spiritism. And he said, I just have, it's like I was under a cloud and I couldn't see. He said, when they knocked on my door and I woke up and went to the door, I opened the door and walked down to the hallway and what I saw when I saw them was a bright light. He said, and the cloud went away. And for the first time, I could see. And he came to the church, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of life and was at every service thereafter. Why? What would have happened if Sutton hadn't knocked on his door? Where would he be today? He'd be still under that cloud, that cloud of the fear of death. On and on and on we can tell stories. Last week in Santa Cruz del Norte, a hundred missionaries went out into the streets to share the gospel. Over 720 people came to save in faith in Jesus Christ. We are in a time of full harvest in Cuba. I learned a lesson of what's called the theology of harvest. And that lesson is, is when it's time to harvest, what do the farmers do? Huh? They harvest. They don't go and build a new barn. They go go to classes to learn the theory of harvesting. They don't go to the theology and learn the finer points of the, of, of harvest. No, they go out in the field and they harvest. And guess what? Harvesting's hard work. But they know if they don't harvest, it will die in the field. Cuba is a spiritual awakening. And that means it's not only um, people coming to Jesus, but people are going into the cults. 
going into the Santeria. Why? Because they are spiritually attuned and they want to get in, they want to know God and they don't know where to look. And so they'll, and, and they need to know Jesus. And many people are going into the Santeria, becoming disillusioned and coming into the church. And we're seeing God move in mighty ways. The gospel is the power of God into salvation to all who believe. I wish I had time to tell you what God is doing today in China, what God is doing today in India, what God is doing in Nepal, in Vietnam what he's doing in Europe, what he's doing in Africa, what he's doing all across our globe. In the Americas, right now, which is, is everything from, from Mexico all the way down to the, the end of America, of, of, of the point of, of South America, there are 999 ethno-linguistic people groups. 365 of those groups have less than 2% evangelical. 214 of those groups don't have anybody that has any specific strategy to reach them. And 36 of them you can't even find. They're back in the jungles of, of Brazil or Peru. And they're, they're, we have missionaries trying to reach out and to reach those people. The International Mission Board is working with local churches to send missionaries across the globe. We're taking the gospel to extreme places. The gospel has yet to reach the most remote areas of our globe. Deep jungles and arid deserts contain almost 750 million people. Hundreds of unreached and unengaged in Spanish olvidado, personas forgotten groups that have no access to the gospel and very few have even portions of the scripture in their own language. We're taking the gospel to the global cities. As of 2014, 54% of all the people in our, glo on our, in our world live in global cities. Now, how many of y'all have been to New York City? I, I haven't been to New York City. How many of y'all have been to Mumbai, India? Okay, I went to Mumbai, India with, with Kishore and, and with Laurie and, and Wendy. And let me tell you something. That was an experience for me. Millions upon millions upon millions of people. Idols upon idols upon idols. Deep poverty, amazing richness, all in one place, all in need of a Savior, all in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where does that leave us? We live in Weston. At last, I understood there's about 69,000 people live in Weston. It's now over 50% Latino. Over 40% Anglo, 5% Asian, 4.5% African American. 41.2% of Western residents were not born in the United States. The mission field has come to our door. Now, I did hear there was an advantage of living in South Florida, and so that you're so close to the United States. And so it gives us an opportunity to, 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 that the world is coming to our doors. You look across the highway and you've got a Mormon temple. You go down the road, you have a Sikh mosque. You have mosques, Hindu temples, Buddhist retreat centers. You have everything here. And we have an opportunity to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a survey done of people who come to Weston, and I came to find out from this survey, and I don't know the truth of it or not, but it said that 37% of Western residents identify as religious. That means 63% do not identify with any religion. We have 63% of the population around us every single day have a need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. You are a part of a large family of Southern Baptists. 38,000 church, I mean, sorry, 47,000 churches, 15 million members. And God has given you an opportunity to join with that family in prayer, in giving and in going. Now, specifically, what does this mean for you? God has created every Christian to be on mission with God. He has called every disciple to make disciples. He's called every church to plant churches. He's called every leader to train leaders. 
that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the glory of his kingdom might fill the earth. Just through the IMB, there are various pathways for you to become involved. There are other organizations as well, like Fellowship of Christian Athletes and others, that, that, are, that are great ways to, 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 to get out and, and, and minister for the cause of Christ. But just with the International Mission Board, there's what's called Team Associates. It's for professionals and, and, and students, retirees, that are able to go to the mission field and come alongside an International Mission Board team and work on their team to reach the lost and to plant churches. There's the master's program for those who are 50 and older. And I thought, uh-oh, I, I think I got there already. But if you're 50 or older and you want to be involved in missions, it's a two or three year commitment that you can go and serve on the mission field. Journeyman program for those that are 21 to 26. You can go and spend two years during your college years and go across the world, share the gospel and come back with amazing experiences. There's the 2 plus 2 program where you can go to one of our six Southern Baptist seminaries. You can study for two years in the seminary, then you go overseas and you study for two years while you're doing mission work. So you leave with a, with a, with a, a great multicultural experience. You've been involved in the kingdom work, and at the same time, you leave with the Masters of Divinity. There's, a, there's a one ministry called uh, Carios Initiative, which is... Uh, especially for Hispanics, los Latinos ya tenemos un camino. There's a, there's a pathway for, for Hispanics to be involved in, in missions. The church planter apprentice, which is 80% of all of our missionaries go through that way, and that way they go to serve on the field for three years. And in the end, then they decide along with, with the, the, the IMB and, and, and our family and the Holy Spirit of God work together as to whether they want to become career missionaries or not. So we've talked about the three things that you can do. The first thing that we ask you to do is we ask you to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send laborers into his harvest. We ask you to go to be a part of the short-term teams that go out of this church to consider giving your life to the cause of global evangelization. We also ask that you give that others may go. And every time you give an offering at this church, a percentage of that goes to what's called the cooperative program that helps to send missionaries to the nations. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering last year took 197, I'm sorry, $157 million that went to share the gospel across the world. God has given us an amazing opportunity to participate with him on what he's up to. Is there anything in this world worth, worth missing out on God's plan for your life? The Bible says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God has before laid out for us to walk in. There are things that God has for each one of you to do that I can't do, that the pastor can't do, that their neighbor can't do, that God has for you to do. God has invited you and invited me to be on mission with God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks, Father, for the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your only son. That every man and woman and boy and girl might have an opportunity to come to know you as Lord and Savior of life. Father God, I pray even now, if there's anyone in this place that does not know you, that today is the day of salvation, that now is the accepted time, that they might come at the end of the service, grab one of the pastors or deacons by the hand and say, help me to come to know Jesus. Father, each one of us has opportunities around us every day to share our faith. We are the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Jesus didn't have a plan B. He sent his disciples into the world that the world might be reconciled to God. We are his ambassadors, and we give you thanks for the blessing and the privilege that we have to work in your harvest field. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen.